you for worshiping with us. Thank you for being here today. Before you're seated, we want to encourage you right now to step out from where you are. Greet somebody, meet somebody new. You have one minute, and then you can be seated. Good morning, New Beginnings. The house is full. Hey, if there's a seat next to you, you might squeeze in just for those that might be coming in late. It is so great to see every single one of you and have you in the house. Today is a special day. Uh, we're doing baby dedications here in a minute. We're doing water baptisms later after this afternoon. And uh, man, I am so excited that you are here with us today. However, last weekend we had a special guest speaker, Dr. Wes Beavis, and it was an incredible weekend because he taught some of our leadership on Saturday evening, and then he taught here Sunday morning, and then we had a, a, a teenage parenting health, mental health class Sunday afternoon. How many of you were blessed by last weekend by Dr. Wes? Man, I am so glad. Uh, I know that Lanessa and I are blessed every month because he is our counselor and uh, not because we need like marriage counseling, because I need counseling and, uh, and she's there to make sure that I follow everything that he tells me that I'm supposed to do. So she's my accountability, right? Um, anyways, hey, it was a, a powerful weekend. I know that God spoke and, and helped people um, with just challenges and struggles of life and children because parenting is so much fun. Right? It's fun and it's challenging all at the same time. But I know that maybe some of you weren't here last weekend and, uh, and he left us a couple books that I want to give out. This is the message that he taught on. I'm um, talking about shake that snake for goodness sake. And uh, what a great message. And so um, I have three books here. If you were not here last weekend and you would like one of these, will you raise your hand? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, 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 now now y'all are making me choose sides. First three people up here get one. There's one. There's two. Oh. All right. Who, who wanted one that didn't get one? Who wanted one that didn't get one? Okay. Okay. All right. Look, look around, church people, because like, so you guys bought like 50 of them last week from him, okay? So, so he said share. So, um, if, so once you read it, you know, take notes. Once you read it, pass it on to someone. And, uh, and so um, we're just so glad that he was with us last weekend and believing that the things that we learned from him that we can apply and that our families and our kids are healthier and better off because of it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, we're going to do uh, baby dedications here in a minute. So as uh, these families are coming to join me on stage, I'm going to get my dad jokes out of the way. Um, and so I, I do want to say this. Um, I, I, over the last, I mean, last year, um, uh, Bethany gave me a dad joke book. And then this last year, the barbers brought me home a little box thing of dad jokes. And, and today, uh, Sid came, hey, Pastor Sean, I've got a gift for you. I've got a new dad joke book for you. And I don't know if it's because my jokes are that bad or it's because you love them so much that you're like, we've got to keep encouraging him. Give him more jokes to say he needs. He... Listen, I know I'm not funny because looks aren't everything, okay? So I got to create some humor somewhere, okay? So, so I got one for you this morning. Are you ready? Yeah. Do you have the tomatoes ready? 
Liars. Alter, altar call right now. Liars in the house already. Oh. Why is, why is six afraid of seven? Okay. Oh. But I'm not done yet. But why did seven eat eight, nine? Because he needs three square meals a day. Ooh! Bring it. I will have to say it is, it is quite interesting that the person who told me that joke to say today is the supplier of the tomatoes. Hypocrite. What a hypocrite. That's what you get, Vince. Taste of your own tomatoes. Oh. All right, I got a couple out of the book. Are you ready? So, um, so this... This la- la- actually last Friday, I was cutting a tree down, and in the process, I-, I injured myself, like really, really bad, like significantly, like to the point where my family thought, like, did you break your leg? I almost thought I broke my leg when I first did it, and I was thankful that I didn't because after I finished cutting the tree and loading it in the truck and everything, then I looked at my leg. I didn't, you know, that's when I looked at my leg, right? Because I didn't want to scare myself. Because if I could walk on it and I could put pressure on it, I should, I should be. Everybody say should be should be okay. And I was like, listen, if I can put pressure on it, if I can do a one-legged squat with it, I should be okay. Because if I broke it, I wouldn't be able to do that. Right, doctor? Yes, there, my doctor's looking at me. She's like, okay. So I sent her a picture, and she's like, oh my goodness, you know, what did you do? And um, anyways, um, I just have a major contusion and bump on my leg, and uh, it's beautiful, purple, blue, all colors of the rainbow. Um, but um, talking about injuries and different things, um, if, you, if you break both of your arms, what should you do? I would stay away from that place, wherever that is, okay? You. All right, I was trying to memorize a joke. I messed it up. All right, everybody, everybody look up here. I'm going to do the little flashy thing, and you forget that, forget to get that I said that. Okay, you ready? I'm going to say it right this time. What should you do if you break your arm in two places? I know, it was bad. It was bad. Tomatoes, tomatoes, please. That was a good shot, girl. Stay away from that place. If you break your arm in two places, stay away from that place. (laughs) Karis is like, I get it. I finally get one of Pastor Sean's jokes. So in in talking with Tracy, I, I said, hey, my ears are ringing. Can you tell me what I should do? And she said, you should answer it. (laughs) Ha, 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 We don't have our baby-dedicated families up here. Oh, I, that's what I wanted them up here. I, wanted, I, I was setting the stage, literally setting the stage, so that when I was done, they were here. That was the whole point. Now i got to tell another joke while they're coming. What's Tigger's favorite Dog, Weenie the Pooh. Weenie the Pooh, yeah. Ah. So today we are, we have these two precious families here on stage, and it's amazing. Um, how much our church has grown since we've come back from COVID. 
significantly. And a lot of that is due to um, some COVID babies. Uh huh. And, and post COVID babies as well. And, uh, and, and those that are, have come to know the Lord and make a relationship with Him. And. Uh, come on, you know I'm funny, Lippy. You know it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And. A growing church is a sign that it's a healthy church. And growing a church when people are giving their lives to the Lord is exciting. But making the church grow by making babies is more fun. Amen? It's biblical. If you've got a problem with it, take it up with God, okay? It was, his, it was his idea for procreation, okay? He said, we might as well have fun. We might as well worship a little bit. So, uh, the thing about baby dedications, just so we kind of lay the foundation of this, baby dedications really are a way of us dedicating these precious gifts that God has given us back to him, okay? As Joshua 24 says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, and that is the principle of this, is these are families that are saying, we want to raise our children in a godly home that fears the Lord in a healthy biblical way. And the responsibility as parents, being parents is already a huge enough responsibility, right? But the spiritual responsibility is even greater, is even greater. And a lot of that falls upon the priest of the home, you dads, you men, to lead your house in all those aspects, in all the ways of, of serving the Lord and, and, and living in a way that, that is going to in, inspire them to want to know God the way that their dad knows the Lord. Hi, sweetie. And that responsibility covers many different facets biblically, spiritually, emotionally financially leading the way but also being maybe the disciplinarian right the bible in ephesians says dads don't exasperate your kids which means don't drive them crazy don't be angry all the time right but teaching them to respect and to fear not only you but god and also the moms we know naturally moms are nurturers they're more or less the caretakers. They're the ones that most of the time stay at home and, and they have that burden of, of constant touch and constant responsibility. And so, but we work together, right? Because when you got married, Scripture says well, the two became one and you were one serving together. You might discipline together. You might have different disciplinary styles, but it's compromising and serving and leading and caring for your family in that way. <sighs> yeah. And although the parents have a huge responsibility, being a part of this family of new beginnings, you all have a responsibility as well. Because you've heard the statement that it takes a village to raise a child. That's so true. It takes a community. It takes an extended family. And for some of these, family is close by but not always, right? And so it's always good to have a fallback, to have this family that can care, that can support, that can babysit so you can still go on dates. Yes. That's you. Yes. If you like kids. <laughs> if you don't like kids, stay away. Leave them alone. Okay? But we all have a responsibility to support these families emotionally, spiritually, because it's challenging. It's even more challenging today than it was 20 years ago to raise kids. So it's so important that we do that. So we're going to pray over the dads. We're going to pray over the moms. We're going to pray over these babies. And then we're going to pray over you. Amen. Would you join me as we pray? God, we thank you today 
for these men of God who are leading by example what it is to be the priest of the home. And God, I pray today that you would guide them, that you would direct them, that you would give them wisdom beyond their years to be the men of God that you've called them to be. And Lord, today we declare that these children are yours and we are dedicating them back to you. God, thank you for these precious gifts that you have entrusted into our care. And God, today we, as the men of our homes, we take that and accept that challenge to be the priest of our home to be the men of God that you've called us to be. God, we thank you for these mighty women of God. We thank you for the wiring and the nurturing care that you have gifted them with. That God, as they invest time and energy into these precious ones, God, that you would give them the mental, the emotional, the physical support to do so. God, we pray right now, God, for strength in their body, strength in their mind. God, that you would bless these families. God, that you would provide for them in every way possible. God, as they are faithful to your house and faithful to serving you and knowing you more, God, that you will provide for them. God, we pray for the finances of their home. God, we pray that you would provide the necessary things in place to provide a healthy home, a godly home. And God, we thank you for that. God, we pray right now for these precious gifts you've given us. God, we thank you for Sierra. God, we pray that you would bless this family. We thank you for for Natalie. God, that you would bless this amazing, precious gift that you have given the Holcombs. And God, today, we as the church, we accept the challenge that you've called us to be as the body of Christ, followers of you, servants of you, that God, we would support these families. God, that we would be there for them to help nurture them, to help grow them, to to care for them in ways that that maybe they would never even think are possible. But God, you would provide opportunities. And God, that this church would grow even further beyond our understanding and our expectation because we're serving you and we're living for you. God, we thank you today for these precious gifts that you've given us. God, as we dedicate them back to you, just as Jesus was brought to the house by Joseph and Mary to be dedicated. God, today, we believe, God, your power in filling these precious ones. And God, we pray for the day and the time that they make a personal commitment as you to be their Lord and their Savior, Lord. And God, we thank you today. God, your word says to train up a child as a way that they would go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. And God, today, we declare and believe that Sierra and Natalie are going to be your children, and they're going to live for you. And God, you have a special calling for their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We have a Bible for you and a certificate for you. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. There you go. Would you guys show some love for these guys? We love them so very much. Amen. Amen. Precious gifts, amen? Children are truly that. They truly are a precious gift from God. And God has called us as believers and followers to evangelize and to procreate so that the church would grow. So that there are those that are raised in church that, that have that understanding, that biblical foundation, and that there are those that, are, that maybe come along later in life and, and they, they, they hear of the gospel of Jesus and the power of what Jesus done and they've accepted him as their Lord and their Savior. And that's the beauty of new beginnings is, is our, our belief statement is we are about discovering life together. Together. Everybody say together. We're discovering life together at different stages of life. We have precious babies that today we're dedicating. Later on, we're doing water baptism of those that are saying, I'm wanting to take that next step and making Jesus my Lord and my Savior, that public confession that I want to serve him and I want everyone to know that I'm a child of God and that I'm living for him and the accountability that comes with that. And having and raising children in a godly home is a way of doing that. 
And the other way that we do that is by serving and ministering to what we call the least, the last, and the lost. The least, the last, and the lost. You see, at some point, you and I, we all fit into one of those categories. We felt like we were less than and that we didn't deserve the price that Jesus paid on the cross. We felt like that we were left out and maybe we were, were set aside. But in reality, you weren't set aside, church. You might have been set apart for something that God had for you, for a destined time for you to come to know Him, to have faith in Him, to believe to get you through a tragedy or a difficulty in your life. And God showed up at the right moment and said, I'm here for you, and I've already paid a price for your salvation. The least, the last, and the lost. Maybe you're here today, and you may even feel like, Pastor Sean, I'm still lost in this thing called Christianity. I don't have it all figured out. But let me reassure you, the majority of us in this room today, no matter how long we've been saved, we still don't have it all figured out either. That's why faith is so important. Because faith goes beyond your understanding. Faith goes beyond what you know and what you even believe. I can't believe that that is what happened, but because of my faith, it supersedes my belief. That is the culture of new beginnings. That's how we function. That's how we operate. And we are here to minister to this community. As amazing as it is, as weird as it is, as super smart and scientific as it is, as much as they need facts, realistically it comes down to our faith. It comes down to our faith. You see, we at New Beginnings, we believe in the equipping and the empowering of people for them to use their gifts and their talents that God has given them to serve the body of Christ. I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to brag on this worship team. Goodness gracious. I, every week, I'm blown away, speechless, literally, because to hear a congregation worship and to hear the voices of the congregation louder than what's coming off of the stage just melts my heart because that's been such a desire to have people that, that are hungry to worship God. I promise you not to knock other churches in this community, but I promise you that there are other churches in this town that you go there and people are just spectating during the worship service. But God has not called us to be spectators. He's called us to be worshipers, true worshipers. And you may not jump around and be wild and crazy like Pastor Sean, but man, those songs they were singing this morning, I'm like, goodness gracious. If that don't stir you up, your spoon done fell out your bowl. God has blessed this church with such talented people, such talented people to lead us into worship, to teach us, to inspire us, to help us to grow, to help the kingdom of God to grow. You see, because God has called each of us to be kingdom builders. Everybody say kingdom builders. God has called us, God has called you to be a kingdom builder. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. Now look at your other neighbor who's your second guess, who's the less than that you chose, and say, he's talking to you. God has called you and I, us, to be kingdom builders. Those that were just up here on stage, they're building the kingdom by making babies. Those of you who invited people to come to Easter service, you're a kingdom builder. Those of you that served this morning, whether it was greeting someone at the door, whether it was making coffee, bringing the donuts, cleaning the bathrooms this week, making sure that this place was prepared, you're kingdom builders. Yeah. 
Here's the other thing. We, we naturally default to people falling in those categories if they do something at the church, okay? But let me tell you this. Bethany, before you walk out of the room, your business is a kingdom builder. Your practice is a kingdom builder. Those of you that are in the schools, you're kingdom builders. Those of you that are group leaders at the lab, guess what? You are a kingdom builder. God has called us to be the light and the salt. And some of you might be more saltier than others. And you might take that in like the negative way, like, right? Your verbiage is a little salty, uh uh-huh. But God wants to change that. He wants to transform that. Because salt enhances flavor. Some of you, how many of you are, are those that before you ever even take a taste of your meal wherever you're at, you salt it before you even taste it? Uh huh. Y'all are addicts. <laughs> salt addicts. Right? You just want to be more salty, is what it is. God wants us to be salt. See, here's the thing 1 Peter 4 10 said, God has given us each a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts, and we are to use them to serve one another. We are to use them to serve one another. It looks very different for lots of different people based on what your talent is, based on what your skill set is, based on your personality. But we all have been given gifts. And, and so when we talk about gifts, there, there are some, sometimes when we think about gifts, we think about people And we're like, you know, when God was passing out gifts, it was like, you know, we all have those people that we know it felt like they just kept cutting in front of you back in line, and they're more talented and more gifted from you, and it's just like, it's not fair. Everything you do turns to gold, right? And everything I do just dies, right? You have some people that are born with a green thumb. You give them a plant, and it just naturally grows. You give me a plant, and it just goes... Give me more sunlight. Help me. It's the opposite. When we talk about those gifts, it might be a gift of prophecy or a gift of serving, a gift of hospitality. There are some people that you just naturally smile. People are attracted to you. Some of you, you have the gift of gab. You can talk to somebody that you've never met in five minutes. You're their best friend. That's a gift. Some of you have the gift of giving. You're very generous. Some of you have the gift of teaching or the gift of encouragement. And the Bible says that we are to use those gifts to serve one another. Not to be self-serving things, but to serve one another. And so sometimes the gifts that we have, we can benefit from having those gifts. But we have to be reminded that God has given you that gift to bless someone else, to encourage someone else, to serve someone else. Jesus, of all people, when he came, he says, I did not come to be served, I came to serve. The one that we should all be willing to say, Jesus, what can I do for you? What can I get for you? Here, let me take that for you, Jesus. Jesus says, no, I've got this. Let me serve you. Just like a couple weeks ago when I washed feet of those that were on this stage, let, let me wash your feet We're to serve one another. Verse 11 in that, in that chapter we were just looking at says, Do you have the gift of speaking? I think and hope I do. I hope I do. I hope I have the gift of speaking because that's what I do for a living. Sometimes I question because I get caught up in my own words and I make up words that don't even matter. Like my brain works faster than my mouth. And so it's just like sometimes I, I, I just, I don't, do I have it? 
right? You, you, sometimes you question, am I really gifted in that area? And we diminish our gifting. We think, we just, we, sometimes we feel like Moses. He's just like, I got a stuttering problem, God. How are you going to use me to speak? Because it's not about your ability. It's about using the ability that God has wired and used inside of you. Because it was all up to you, then you would take the credit for it. You would take the glory. But when you know it's like, this is way beyond me. This is far greater than what I think I can do. But it says, if you have the gift of speaking, then speak as though God himself is speaking through you. Or do you have the gift of helping others do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies? Listen, this morning, my, my message to you today is, is, not a, is not a Tupperware sales pitch. I'm not selling you pampered chef cooking supplies. I'm not trying to sell you high-end vacuums. Or calling you about your car warranty insurance. <laughs> Today I want to talk to you about something that's far greater than that. It's not much fun to talk about, but it's far greater than that, okay? Something that is more valuable. Everybody say valuable. valuable. It's more valuable and it's more important. And it's about being a good steward of the resources that God has given us. Being a good steward of the resources that God has given you. And just as I challenge these men to be the priest of their home, I am the priest of this church. I am the leader of this church. And so the responsibility falls upon me to make sure that I teach you the things of God that are in the Bible that are foundational for your faith and your understanding of what God wants and expects from you. Now listen, when you sit down with your family and you have a family meeting, okay, Whoever the person is the speaker, whether it's mom or dad, usually it's like, uh-oh, we have to have a family meeting, and usually they don't go well. Usually it's not all fun, right? Today's a family meeting. This isn't all fun, but it's important, and it's valuable, because this might be something that you have known or that you know, but to think and expect that just because it's you know it, that everyone knows it, is not fair. So it's important to teach the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Not to teach the theology of Pastor Sean or Pastor Sean's cool things, but to teach the Word of God. I've already used numerous scriptures to support where we're going today. But God has called you and I to be stewards. He's called us to be stewards of the resources that he has given us. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, it goes without saying. You may not know exactly what that phrase means. Maybe you've heard someone else say it, but you didn't know exactly what it means. But simply is this, it means something that is so obvious that it doesn't even need to be said. It goes without saying goes without saying. So, so how does that apply to this? It goes without saying that we're called to be good stewards of the resources, of the gifts and the talents that he's given us. We should know that. And some, some of us, some of you, are better stewards of the things than others. And it's not a comparison thing about, well, I'm, better, I'm a better steward than they are, but God has called us individually to be the best stewards of the resources he has given us. And when, at the end of the day, when Pastor Sean is thinking about the growth and the health of the church, I have to steward all of the resources to make sure that we have the right amount of volunteers, the right amount of staff, the right amount of chairs, the right amount of parking spots, the right amount of money in the bank so that we can continue to grow. Stewards. You know, it's one thing when you're stewarding something off of a little bit. You go, I only have a little bit. It's, a, it's pretty easy to manage a little bit. But then when you get a lot, it's a lot more challenging to manage and to juggle lots of different things. Can I have three tomatoes real quick, please? One, two, and... 
So, as stewards, God has called us to, to, to juggle our time. Time is valuable, right? Time is precious. I'm thankful that we have more sunlight throughout the day now. We can do more. We can manage our time a little bit more. But no matter how much time you have, there's always more things that we feel that we need to do than time. Would you agree? We have to manage and steward our time. We have to manage and steward our talent. Your talent is your occupation, the place that you work. The reason you work there and are employed there is because you're good at what you do. You're talented. You is kind. You is important. You is smart. You have to manage that. You have to manage that talent. Some of you, you're, you're getting further in education, further along in your, in your skill set, further along in, in whatever that trade might be. You want to be better at it. You want to be more efficient. You want to continue to grow in your education and your knowledge and understanding. But, but we're looking at time and we're looking at talent. But the last thing that we struggle with, and this is where, we, this is where, the, where, where people get offended, they get their feelings hurt, okay? Everybody pick your toes up off the ground, okay? Treasure. Money. So let me preface by saying this. God does not need your money. He doesn't. The Bible says he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Not a thousand cattle on a hill. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That's a lot of beef. But it isn't about God needing your money because God will provide the resource. But it's about us understanding that he's blessed us with the time, with the talent, and with his treasure. And it's our responsibility as stewards to juggle those things in life. And understand that sometimes it gets difficult and we have to figure out how do we do these things, right? I learned that talent at the age of 15 in my bedroom juggling socks so that I could today, 30 years later... Use that as an illustration. Thank you for that talent, Lord. Thank you for the time that I put in that might have seemed meaningless at the time other than just doing something. That's like, listen, where is he? If you gave me a Rubik's Cube, bro, I would be lost. Completely like, yep, I, I, listen, when I would do a Rubik's Cube as a kid, I would take the stickers off. And put them back on the right side. That's a talent. You might think that's a silly talent, but it's a talent. And God has called each of us to be good stewards of those gifts and those resources. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. Look what Romans says. It says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift isn't to encourage others, be encouraging. If your gift is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, then take responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Some of you are like, oh, that's me. I got that one. Yep, I got that one. Uh Uh-huh, yep, sure. Oh, we got to the giving one. Never mind, that's not me. That's for them. Why? Because it's going to cost you something. I've chosen today to focus on the most difficult gift that nobody wants to teach on and nobody wants to hear. Because it's going to cost you something. So it goes without saying today, I want to teach on the gift of giving. The gift of giving 
is different from the discipline of tithing. Tithing, although might be an Old Testament principle that we see all the way initiated in Genesis between Cain and Abel giving of what they were gifted of doing and they would return that back to the Lord and saying, God, thank you for the ability to do these things and I want to honor you with that gift and that talent and that resource that you're providing me. We see that initiated and instituted there. And you might be here today and say, Pastor Sean, that was Old Testament. And today we live under the New Testament. We're under a new covenant because Jesus came. Yes, but Jesus, when he came, he says, I didn't come to abolish the Old Testament. I came to fulfill. In fact, the things that are there, they're not even good enough for what I'm expecting of you in the New Testament to do and to be. But if you'll allow me to fall back on my gifting of teaching and leadership and allow me to teach for a moment, I think you'd be surprised to know that a recent study says that only 3 to 5% of Christianity in the United States actually give 10% of their income to the local church. Three to five percent. I think even if our church was giving 10 percent, we would have more resources than we would know what to do with if that principle applies to new beginnings, okay? I will tell you that I know that our church is blessed. Lanessa and I came here in the end of 2008. Since the middle of 2009, we've never struggled financially. Thank the Lord. We've never struggled financially. Up to that point, Pastor Sean was working outside of the church to help pay the church bills. Thankfully, we're not there anymore. But as this thing grows, as this family grows, just like as your family grows, when you, had, when you were feeding one kid, one kid's different from feeding one teenager. Especially a teenage boy. So as this thing grows, so do the finances. So do the finances. I'm, I'm trying to stick to my notes, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I may repeat something if I, if I don't go there, okay? But let me just tell you this. This is what I know about church and church goers. The last thing that people go to church will commit to is giving. It's the last thing, statistically. It's also the first thing that they'll stop doing when they, when they don't like what's going on. Talking about those statistics that I mentioned a minute ago, there are many reasons why people would say they don't commit or give faithfully the tithe, the 10%. Here's a couple of them. <laughs> I don't make enough money to afford to. Listen, I know that not everybody that works at the lab makes $180,000 a year. But when that's your median income for Los Alamos, that's far greater than Curry County of $23,000 a year. Far greater. Some people don't do it because they say it's an Old Testament principle. Some people don't do it because they say, I made it, therefore it's all mine. Some don't do it because they say the church has enough money. Some don't do it because they say, I don't trust preachers, and they make too much money already anyways. That can happen. 
Sometimes that does happen. I've seen it. I've seen pastors abuse finances. That's why we have boundaries here. Pastor Sean doesn't collect the offering. Pastor Sean doesn't count the offering. Pastor Sean doesn't even deposit the offering at the bank. I have a team of people that do that. Is that because I'm untrustworthy? No. It's because if anybody ever wants to say, Pastor Sean's doing something wrong financially, I can say, I, I have literally nothing to do with it. I don't sign my own check. All of our checks require how many signatures? Two. Alan, would you come at this point? This is a good time for you to come. Alan is one of our board members, and during our, Alan, during our, our pre-huddle service, each Sunday before service, we have a pre-huddle with our, with our team, and I share with them a lot of times about what the message is going to be about, and how to pray, and how to just, just know where we're going, and how to pray for the rest of our congregation, that, that God would, would speak to you through those things, and so today as I shared, Alan just was just like, just said, Pastor, I want to say something. And so what he had to say fell in line with even with the Bible study. Are you, are you talking about that a little bit? Okay. Um, so I'll shut up and I'll just as you go. Alan, Alan is one of our board members. Alan is one of, he's on our uh, check signing. He helps with finances. He does some of those things. Wears lots of different hats. Talented guitarist. He's using all of his gifts, all of his talents, and all of his resources. Alan is a great steward. He's a great steward. That's why I'm allowing him to share today. Good morning. Uh, so... So first off, you know, you know, Sean was kind of giving us a little tidbit, a little farther away, right there. All right, great. A little tidbit of, of what service was, and you know, you know, I uh, I was like, wow, that's interesting because you know, so right now, uh, men's Bible study, we're doing a Bible study called, well, it's called the Awe of God, but the the message of this Bible study is all about having a healthy and holy fear of God, and you know. The subject of our lesson wasn't really about tithing or giving necessarily, but, you know, in our discussion, you know, that, that's where the discussion went, and that's where the discussion stayed for, you know, the majority of our Bible study discussion. And, you know, we could just say, well, what a coincidence, right? But I really believe that that's just God's way of aligning things, because giving is something that's very important and ultimately it can be a very touchy subject and Amen. and and i'm going to tell you this i'm not coming up here to pad sean's back at all but i'm going to share something that he may or may not remember before i continue <clears throat> so obviously throughout the time here at the church things have been up and down there have been seasons where things are really good things and, and, and i'm talking about financially right there's been seasons where we have high attendance, high giving, and there's dips in it. But I'll tell you this. You know, at one of the times when we were, you know, getting more income, there was more money coming into the church, Sean was the first one to say, at some point we'll have to talk about putting a cap on my salary. That was his idea. That wasn't even our idea as the board. So I know it's, it's fair to say, you know, we've seen it that preachers – have, you know, gone out of control and they've abused giving, right? They've used the topic of giving to exalt themselves, to bless themselves. But I can tell you that Pastor Sean and Lanessa, they're not doing that. They're not doing that. But also, I would say far more often than what we see, right? We see these people, most of the time it's people right, mega churches, people that have a lot of exposure, we see that those things do happen. But I would tell you that majority of the time, majority of our pastors throughout the U.S. are probably struggling. There's a lot of churches and a lot of, there's a lot of pastors that are, you know, pastoring smaller churches that are barely getting by. Yeah. And so ultimately, you know, when we talk about tithing, right, like Sean said, you know, some people, it's easy to dismiss and say, well, that's an Old Testament concept, even though the reality of it is, is it was established before the law. Yeah. Jesus spoke on it, and even Paul went further in the New Testament to, to continue to exhort people to give and to be generous. You know, we see in Acts, right, the church grew, right? There was incredible multiplication. First, there was 3,000 saved, then 5,000. And the very next thing it says is that 
what did they do, right? They went and they were selling their property. They were getting rid of all their possessions and bringing it to the apostles. And, you know, we're not telling everybody, hey, go sell your house. You know, we're not, you know, because that, that's not the reality of it, right? For, for that time period, that's what was happening. But, but we can see that with the growth of the kingdom, it is very important that the finances come in. And so what I wanted to reiterate was, you know, from the beginning, when, when, when it was instituted in the law, you know, in, in Deuteronomy, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to share the whole scripture, but I want to just point out, you know, one, in Deuteronomy 14, it talks about bringing the tithe, but it gives us an understanding of what the purpose of the tithe is. And, and that's what I, I want to focus on is the purpose, the purpose of the tithe. And so the Levites were one of the tribes of Israel, and they received no allotment of land. So the idea was they didn't have the means to support themselves. They weren't given land to farm and to, and to raise animals because the intent was their sole purpose was to minister on behalf of all of Israel. So what God did in part by instituting the tithe was First and foremost, the tithe was to be provision for those that minister. And then we can see in addition to that, the idea was also that there would be money, it says, to give to foreigners living among you, the orphans and the widows. God cares about those that have no way of helping themselves. And so as a church, after, you know, ultimately part of the tithe, a big portion of the tithe is to support our pastors. And not just Sean and Lanessa, we're hoping for some time in the future that we're going to be able to fully support a youth pastor, children's pastor. Because that, that's one of the difficulties in, in, in getting ministers to stay is ultimately, right, every time we talk about we want another pastor, and we do, I'm always like, we have to be able to provide for it. And that's because I'm thinking, hey, I know, I know what it's like to raise a family. You know what? We want them to be blessed. We don't, we don't want to have pastors struggling. We don't. We do not want to have pastors struggling. So like I said, so, so the tithe, the purpose of the tithe is primarily that we can have ministers, that we can support ministers so that they can do their job. And then next, it's also so that we can continue doing ministry in the community. Yeah. All the time there's opportunities for us to give, for us to be a blessing, and we want to continue to be able to do that. And so, yeah, I just kind of want to share on that. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. One of the most obvious reasons that people say is they don't tithe is because they don't make much money. But surveys show that it's actually just the opposite of that. They say that the more money you make, the less likely you are to be generous. Because a natural desire to be greedy, to say, I need more money, I need more money, I need more money. We think about Jesus and the illustration of the widow with the two mites. We think about the story that a little bit of where Alan was talking about in the New Testament in Acts where Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of property and they didn't give all of it to the Lord. It wasn't about them not giving all of it to the Lord, but they lied to the disciples that they were giving all of it. That was the issue. It was an integrity issue. And so we want to be men and women of integrity. We want to be faithful and stewards of what God has given us in those areas. Another statistic that's interesting is that the larger a church congregation is, there's less pressure to give. Why? Because people say, look at all these people. Let them give. Surely they have enough. Surely they make more money than I do. Let them give. And I could tell you pretty consistently, it's, it's kind of a funny, not funny thing, but I could tell you today, unless you just totally just blow me out of the water, but based on the attendance, I could tell you whether the offering is going to be good or bad. Am I right, JK? Our financial? Typically. If we have a lot of people, usually the offering is... And a lot of times when we have like 15, 30 people here, the offering will just be like, that was out of the blue. That was unexpected. Now listen, there could be lots of reasons. It could be just because of a pay schedule. It could be because of that. But it's almost like, it's like, well, look at all these people. We, we came to church today, so now we don't have to give. And then, and then like the guilty conscience on the other side is like, you know what? We weren't able to go to our church today. We should probably give. We should probably do our part, right? And so I, I say that jokingly, 
But there's, we've kind of seen that pattern. And so it was like, what is this about? How come we don't have this natural consistency in the area of giving? And we're not trying to figure that out. But what we are doing is looking at what Genesis says when God commanded Adam and Eve when he said, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. That, that's what we were called to do and being good stewards of that. Do you want that for your family? Amen? You want increase? You want, you want to trust God in that way? It's going to take a step of faith. Did you know that's the only place in the Bible? It's the only place in the Bible where God says, test me. It's the only place. Test me and see that I will not bless you. I can say from my life, I've watched it, I've seen it happen. My hope today is that maybe some of you here today, you've been hurt by a church in the area of finances where you've maybe seen it abused or you've seen some of those things. I've heard horror stories of congregations or churches where when people don't tithe, they send the tithe police. I don't know what you give. I don't want to know what you give. Do you know why? Because I know that I'm human. And to those of you, if you give a lot of money, guess what? Pastor Sean's going to come say hi to you. He's going to make sure he shakes your hand. He's going to invite you to dinner. He's get... Am I wrong? Naturally, we're wired that way. That's why I don't count the offering. Because I don't want to have to deal with that burden of, oh, we... we we, listen, we've got to paint the church blue now because they put a check in the offering that said paint the church blue. Or because I know blue is their favorite color when we go to paint the church, we should probably paint it blue. I, we just, we don't operate that way because I've seen it abused. But I hope that you see even how uncomfortable but how confident I can talk about this and challenge you today as believers and followers of Jesus. The giving of our time, our talent, and our treasure. When Jesus taught, many times he would use it in, in parables or in comparisons, but they were based on one's sacrifice for the ability of others. New Beginnings is here to serve you. We're here to serve you. We're here to serve this community. We're here to be the city on a hill, to be the light in a dark place. That's what God's called us to be and to be good stewards of that. You're giving, when you give, you're giving to honor God's commandment And God's instruction. But I want to talk to you about another thing that we instrumented a couple years ago. And it is this principle of giving above and beyond the tithe. Because we see in the giving of the talents, we see that giving, being generous is one of those. And there are some that are really good with managing finances. In fact, last year we did a Financial Peace University. We went through Dave Ramsey's course and we talked about some of the principles and applying and trying to get debt free and trying to be good stewards and trying to get to a place where you are financially independent. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. The, it's a great goal. It's a great goal for all of us to do. But getting to a point where we can give even more, where we can be even more generous... And so, a couple years ago, we 
presented this thing called Kingdom Builders. And it was simply just that. Because out of Kingdom Builders, we give and to serve and we do lots of different things. Whether it's local community outreach, global outreach, tragedy, whether it's serving Convoy of Hope or, or, or different things and meals and doing different things around the world, God has called us to give and to serve in that way. And that comes out of our Kingdom Builders thing. And this Kingdom Builders idea has, has even kind of grown and adapted over the years. There's lots of churches that are, are doing this thing and there's lots of different ways to do it. But simply as this, is, is challenging our church in the area of finances to not just stop at that 10% tithe. To say, God, I want to I give more. God, I want to I trust you for my finances. I want to trust you for the resources. I want to trust you for providing. And I'm going to test you in it. I'm going to try and outgive you, God. What? Sure. I just want to interrupt you for a second. <laughs> when it comes to testing, so in the beginning of the year, um, I felt like God prompted my spirit that to like test me in my my money. And I had never done this before. My husband usually ties our main income altogether, um, but it doesn't include my business. And I thought, mm, I felt like the Holy Spirit prompted me to do that. And I was like, okay, so every week I'm going to tithe a portion of what I make weekly. And since then, I have had more clients than I know what to do with. My business is booming. I tested him, and he has been faithful and over abundantly generous, and, um, and I'm just so thankful for that. And I just think that testing, it's true. He wants to show off. He loves you. That's good. Awesome. Thanks, Steph. The reality is this. Today's challenge should affect every single one of us. It should affect every single one of us. Because some of us, it's, it's using your gifts and talents to serve the church and to serve our community. Say, Pastor, I've got something that I can do. I've got a way, I've got a thing that I'm doing or a thing that I can do that would be considered a kingdom builder to our community. Steph, I even totally forgot about that. You as a hairstylist, you are a kingdom builder to our community. And some of us are all about the kingdom. Some of you, it's, it's using your gifts and talents. Some of you, it's taking that initial step of saying, I want to commit to being faithful to the tithe and bringing that to the storehouse. I will tell you a lot of times, I see this a lot of times in, in a lot of churches uh, because a lot of people think, well, you know, my, my gifting is my talent and my talent is what I tithe to the church. No, your, your gifting and your talent is what you're giving to the church. But your tithe, you're giving to God. Okay? Don't forget that. And then maybe there's some of you in here today, God has blessed you in the area of managing finances. God has blessed you with the gift of generosity. And today I want to challenge you, maybe you will be one that, that says, I, I want to be a kingdom builder. I want to give above and beyond the tithe. I want to go more than what I, I could ever do and be a kingdom builder. See, because out of our general fund, we pay for all of our utilities and our staff and our, all of our goods and all those different things and the maintenance of the church. But out of our kingdom builders thing, which is you will see if you give online, you will see that that is one of the giving tabs that you would, you would commit to. And you can designate how much you give there. Let me challenge you. Do not put your tithe in kingdom builders. Don't do it. That's not the point. Be faithful to the tithe first. Then, as God allows and permits and blesses, continue to give. And give that abundance. Give that offering. So, I mean, can I have one minute? One more minute. I'm almost done. Can we get the water baptism people ready? Because I'm ready. You're on it? You want, that's what I'm saying. You want to get them, the kiddos that are coming down? You're on it. Give Pastor Lanessa a hand. Tithe and offering are two different things. 
What is a tithe? The tithe is the discipline principle of giving the 10%, the first fruits, the first 10%, not the last 10%, the first 10%. I will tell you, if you give God the first 10%, He'll take that remaining 90% and make it stretch. I promise you. But if you wait to be like, hey, if we've got 10% left over, we'll give it, it will never be there. It'll never be there. Tithe is faithfulness and commitment to that dedication and that discipline. An offering is something you give in, a, in addition to. Okay? I do know that periodically we, we have people that, you know, they'll, you know, we, I'll just go back to when we used to take up an offering on a regular basis. Because this gentleman doesn't go to our church anymore. He doesn't even live in Los Alamos. But he, he would take a tithe envelope and he would put his $5 bill in there every week and put in there, tithe. I promise you, he made more than $50 that week. That's not considered tithe. That would fall under an offering. Because it's not meeting the criteria. Okay? So let me challenge you today. God has gifted you with talents. Use those talents to serve others and to honor God. God has blessed some of you with the time and the freedom to do that. Use your time. Be a good steward of your time. Be a good steward of your talent. And lastly, be a good steward of your treasure. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. See, today we, we had people, we had families on stage committing their families and their homes unto the Lord by dedicating their gifts that God had given them, those little ones. And here in a minute we're going to do water baptisms which is those that are committing to take that next step of publicly declaring that Jesus is their Lord and their Savior. Commitments. Dedication. Today, is call, God is calling all of us to make a commitment. To maybe make a further commitment. So let me pray over you this morning. God, I thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. I thank you for the growth of this church, the growth of our family. And God, we thank you for providing everything that we have needed. But God, as we continue to grow, you have called us to be good stewards of what you have given us before you will increase it. Yeah. And so today, Lord, I ask for those in this room, God, that you have blessed them with gifts and talents that they're not yet using. But God, today, they understand how to use that. And they want to commit to using that gift and that talent to serve you. If that's you in this place this morning, would you just raise your hand? I want to use my gifts and my talents for serving the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Maybe you're here today. You say, Pastor Sean, I, I, I've never understood tithe. I've never believed in tithe. But today I'm willing to make that commitment. Make that dedication that I'm going to be faithful to the tithe, faithful to giving of the first fruits of what God has blessed me with. That when I get paid, that I'm going to give that 10% to the Lord, to the house of the Lord for the kingdom of God. If that's you, maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor John, I'm going to commit to giving to the tithe. Commit to giving to the tithe. Amen. One, two, three, four, five, six. God, thank you. Seven, eight. God, thank you that this message today wasn't just coincidental. God, thank you for these today that are going to commit. God, I, today, we trust, we believe, and we know, God, that you are faithful. And God, as we give, God, you will bless, you will provide, and you will do more. Lastly today, maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Sean, that, that whole thing that you just presented about this whole kingdom builders thing, um, God's blessed me with the ability financially. I have the gift of generosity and I want to be a kingdom builder. I'm going to give above and beyond the tithe into the kingdom builders so that we can continue to grow to reach people here and around the world. You say, Pastor John, that's me. Would you just raise your hand? You want to be a kingdom builder. Amen. 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 Seven or eight hands this morning. God, thank you today. God, we thank you that you've called all of us to grow your kingdom, 
to reach the least, the last, and the lost. But God, I pray right now, God, financial blessing and favor upon your people. That God, today, maybe we didn't raise our hand for something, but God, we would secretly even make a commitment to test you, Lord, in the area of giving. And God, we today thank you. We thank you for these babies that we've dedicated. We thank you for these that we're fixing to baptize. And God, today we thank you for your faithfulness. And God, you can be trusted. God, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Are we ready? Awesome photographers uh, in place yeah if you're here for to be baptized if you signed up or if you'll meet me right over here meet us over here so if you're going to be baptized today just come on up and over here and then they'll get set up over there but you're gonna, you'll start here amen amen are you are we ready i'm ready Right here, right over here. What's up, buddy? How are you? Good. Good. Um, hop on in. You want to take your shoes off? Or you want to leave your shoes on? I'll take my shoes. Okay, go for it. Get on in here. <laughs> so, Asher, I don't know if you know this, but I asked your dad if he wanted to baptize you today, and he was like, "Of course." Okay. So, here's the thing about water baptism. It is symbolic and intentional. The symbolism of it is the Bible talks about the old man dying and the new, the new life being resurrected. It's symbolic of that. Okay? Just as Jesus was laid to rest and three days later he rose, we're going to put you in this water and you're going to raise. Now your dad might hold you down a little longer than expected. <laughs> but I won't let him drown you. Okay? All right, have a seat. So you're going to take your left hand, pinch your nose. Your dad's going to grab your wrist. Grab his wrist. You're going to, and then you're going to grab your dad's wrist with your right hand. Boom, just like that. Okay. Asher, upon your profession of faith as Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. did with Asher? Yes. Left hand on your nose. Dad's going to grab your wrist. You're going to grab dad's right wrist, grab his wrist with your right hand right there, just like that. However you want. Yep, that works. Christine, because you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Jesus? 
Yeah. You want to live for him? You want to serve him? Use your gifts and your talents for him? Yeah. Awesome. Well, Samuel, upon your profession of faith, go ahead and grab, grab your nose. Either one. Upon your profession of faith as Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All the way under, Dad. Get him all the way under. at George look at all that hair making me jealous Uh uh-huh George you love Jesus yeah I'm gonna serve him forever yeah awesome go ahead and grab your nose with your left hand pinch your nose with your left hand dad's gonna grab that hand you're gonna grab his there you go George upon your profession of faith as Jesus as your Lord and your Savior I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit having these dads as the priest of their home to serve in that way. Oh my. Have a seat, Robin. So I've known this one since she was born and not even from here her family went to the church that we youth pastored at in Rio Rancho so so amazing honored and blessed to do this today precious precious gifts amen oh Robin you love Jesus Every knows whichever hand I, I'll make it work I'm talented that way Robin, upon your profession of faith, as Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hey, hey, wait, wait. You've got to do that after so you're wet. That's cheating, Mel. That's cheating. This is Joyce, everybody. Say hi, Joyce. Joyce has been coming to New Beginnings for quite a while now. Three years? Four years? Four and a half? Okay, it goes by faster than I do in this room. I'm glad you're keeping track, right? Yeah, you love Jesus? I know you do. I just have to ask that question. It's a part of the process. Ready to serve him? Dedicate everything to him. Jesus, he's my Lord and my Savior, but I 
I've never been baptized in the water. And maybe today, today's your day to take that commitment to that next step. Anybody? Older than middle school. Because all the kids want to come play. Yeah. <laughs> Dad, is he ready? Yeah. Okay. James, you want to come do the honors? James, help me remember. Were you baptized before or after the fire? <coughs> Because you were baptized the week before, right? The Sunday before. And then fire. And then we had the fire. I burned the last church down. He burned the last church down. That's what I thought. I was around. I was like, I think James got baptized the Sunday before we had the fire. I came during the night of the fire. And it helped us. And I told you I'm sorry. That's right. I remember that. We didn't blame you, though. Not at the time. No, we blamed Pastor Kevin. <laughs> it was his guitar. It was his guitar. It was Yes. Anyways, James, what an honor to have you here and to be able to do this, baptize your boy. Yeah. My dad with me when I was eight. Yeah. And now it's that. Pretty awesome. Yeah. I'll <laughs> put in there, Zach. Yeah, bro, your shoes are going to get wet. Just, just open it. My socks are drenched. My hands are drenched. All right, Zach. You love Jesus? You're going to serve him forever? Yes. All right. Sit up. Sit up. Sit up. He's like, I'm just getting ready, Pastor Sean. Go ahead and grab your nose with your left hand. Dad's going to grab your wrist. Okay. Grab Dad's wrist with your other hand. There you go. <laughs> He's ready. All right, Zach, upon your profession of faith as Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Good job, buddy. Proud of you. Uh-oh. Amaret, awesome. All right, Amaret, we've got a couple, a couple things to do here. You're a guest today? Um, I came last Sunday. L last, last Sunday was your first Sunday with us? Okay. Is there somebody here that you came with or that you know? Okay. So you got, you got a group of people who, who can help in your relationship with the Lord. And this could be your family. Because that's part of that's part of my responsibility as the priest, as the shepherd, is to make sure that I know the sheep. And since you've been here two weeks, I don't really know you, but there are people that know you that I can say, "Hey, how's that Miranda doing? We haven't seen her in a couple of weeks. Somebody chase her down. Somebody drag her back if you have to." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I know you're not supposed to ask that question. 25. How long have you known the Lord? Most of your life. Never been baptized in water before? First time? Okay. So. Pretty awesome. The Lord knew we were doing this today and knew you would be here. That's how much he loves you. He cares about you. As I said earlier, that this is symbolic for us. The main intent and reason for it is the accountability side. For all those people out there who say, I was there when you were baptized. I was there when you said, I want to serve the Lord. And the accountability comes with it. But it's not a judgmental thing. It's we're in this together.
Stephanie, are you over there to get baptized? What a beautiful day. What a beautiful day. Thank you for being with us today. We love you so very much. Our prayer partners are going to be up front to pray with you about anything that you need prayer for. Pastor Les, do you have any announcements you need to make today before we uh, Not a whole lot. Ladies, if you haven't gotten your balloon tickets, make sure you do that. That's coming up in just a couple weeks. It's a ladies' night out. It's an opportunity for you to get dressed up if you want to. It's going to be super fun. Uh, we are excited about it. Um, like the prayer partners are here. If we have guests, we do have guests that are in the house. Thank you for joining us. If you would fill out the welcome card in the seat pocket in front of you, you can place those in the giving boxes as you head out today, or you can scan that QR code and fill it out online. Once again, we're so thankful that you were here. It means a lot that you came today. Um, if you're looking for the online service, it's going to be recorded and uploaded later. So if people are asking you about it, we had some technical difficulties, but it will be up there later. But we're glad that you, every single one of you, um, were here today. We hope you have a fantastic week, and we'll see you Hey, since I soon. talked about it, can you talk about our giving platform? and how people can give. Yeah, and if, if you want to know how to give, we have the boxes in the back. You can fill out um, in, the, in your seat pocket. There is a car, uh, envelope. You can put it that way, or you can give online through Secure Give. You can go to our website, mbfla.org, and you can give that way too. But, and it has all the links for ties, kingdom builders, and all the things. But we love you so much. Thank you for being a generous church. We are so blessed to be here, and we hope you have a fantastic week. Mm -hmm.